Chatting with Tim, so it's his fault that I don't have a new brain. We're going to continue with cessation. Uh, do keep in mind as we go through this today, uh, that we're following Sam Waldron's book called To Be Continued. We're going through it. I try to get attribution to him so that he'll be in Acts 21 9. Everybody remember that? Acts 21 9. We're going to run into this filthy evangelist. I'll read that to you. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied to her first. Can um, we then understand prophecy in the New Testament being fundamentally the same as the Old Testament? Can we see that there were prophets named as such? And we can take them as such, and not just that they were prophesying for the moment, but they were prophets in the traditional sense. Um, Alvin does a really good job of explaining this um, exactly that. First, let me read this a little bit of a long quote, but bear with me. Calvin says, This is added for the commendation of Philip. Not only that we might think that his house was well ordered, but also that it was famous and excellent through the blessing of God. For assuredly, it was no small gift to have four daughters all endowed with the spirit of prophecy. By this means, the Lord meant to beautify the first beginnings of the gospel when he raised up men and women to foretell things to come. Prophecies had now almost ceased many years among the Jews, to the end that they might be more attentive and desirous to hear the new voice of the gospel. Therefore, seeing the prophesying which was in a manner which was in a manner quite ceased, doth now after a long time return again. It was a token of the more perfect state. Notwithstanding, it seems that the same it seems that the same was the reason why it ceased shortly after, for God did support the old people with diverse foretellings until Christ should make an end of all prophecies. What's he saying here? That's what Walter said. Old Testament, New Testament prophecy is fundamentally the same. It comes in the same way from the Spirit of God speaking through a person, most men, but sometimes women, as in this case, and Deborah 
is named both judge and prophetess. In 2 Kings 22, uh, same as 2 Chronicles 34, Huldah, the prophetess, now she actually speaks for God and makes prophecy in the traditional sense, okay? 2 Kings 22, 16, Thus says the Lord, this is Huldah, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants, all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read. Uh, that was in Josiah's time. You remember the book of the law was found? And when Josiah heard and read, that he tore his robes and he repented in sackcloth and ashes, because now he understood why they were in such bad shape. The word of God had been hidden away for a long time. And then they found out Golden was this prophetess and she spoke for the Lord, directly for God, prophecies in the traditional futuristic sense. So what do we conclude here? That a prophecy, in every sense of the word, continued throughout the entire development of Scripture. Okay? From Genesis to Revelation. Now prophecy was predominantly, but far from exclusively, the realm of men. Okay? Now regarding positive questions, we'll track them along with this, okay? Regarding apostles, was that office limited, this was Charles's question, was that the office limited to only the 12, as named in Matthew 10, 1 through 4, Mark 3, 13 to 19, and Luke 6, 12 to 15? Now, those three Gospels, in those passages I just read out, that's where Jesus, in Luke, he prays all night, and the other ones, obviously, pray all night, but they don't say that specifically. That's when, in the morning, he names the 12 disciples as apostles. The same 12 disciples who are following him now named specifically apostles. Right? So, was it limited only to them? The turn, if you will, to follow along down these scriptures. Acts 14, 14. Whoever gets there first, just read it out. If you don't know if you first you see the first time, go ahead. Read it out. Yeah, Acts 14, 14. But when the apostles of Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd crying, crying out. Thank, Thank you. you. Is Barnabas ever named amongst the disciples? Saying, you know, we know Luke is an inspired author, inspired by the Spirit of God. And as he say here, the apostles, Barnabas, and Paul. So, what do we conclude about Barnabas? Somebody? He's an apostle. He's an apostle. Okay. But he's not one of the twelve. He's not even one who's born out of due time. He's an apostle. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 9, 5, and 6. not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Okay. So, so again, yeah. other apostles. Now other apostles can mean Paul speaking of himself and then he's saying, what about those other twelve? Are they the only ones? Okay. That could mean that. As do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord. Uh, what are the names of the brothers of the Lord? We know that there was Jude. We know that there was James, the brother of the Lord. So let's just stop with those two because we know those for sure. And they were very sons. Um, the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord, are they being included in this title of apostles? Yeah. They're apostles. Now, Again, we have this distinction. I'm calling them capital A apostles, the ones who are named specifically and personally by Jesus Christ, small A apostles, these other ones, but they are apostles. Um, so the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, Cephas is Peter, who's one of the capital A apostles. So 
so other apostles and brothers of the Lord as he was, he gathers them all together into this one rubric. Paul's including them as administering the same office as himself. No brothers of the Lord were named by Jesus as apostles in the Gospels. In fact, in John 7, when we read about the brothers of the Lord, he says, even his own brothers were not believe him. But it wasn't until after his resurrection when James, the author of the book of James, or Jude, or these other brothers, came to believe him. While he lived, they didn't. Here they are, after the resurrection, and Paul says, by the Spirit of God, writing the inspired scripture, they were apostles. 1 Corinthians 12, 29. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles? That implies that some in the church could have been, or maybe even were, apostles and or prophets. And he's speaking of the Corinthians church. He's talking about this distribution of gifts. And his question is, are all of you apostles? Well, what does that imply? Well, the, the answer would be, no, we're not all apostles. But clearly in the question, implying some of you not only could be, but are. And the same with the other offices. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles. Okay. Uh, Galatians 1.19. Somebody who read that out for us here in the Revelation. Galatians 1 19. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Okay. Okay, right, again. Yeah. James, the Lord's brother, not named by Jesus as an apostle, but under inspiration, Paul, writing Galatians, the book of Galatians to the Galatians, he's speaking of James, the Lord's brother, as an apostle. Uh, the, Ephesians 9, 2, 19 and 20 also bears on this. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now, this is a really interesting verse, and this is why we, at the beginning, pointed out that the apostles were prophets. Not all prophets were apostles, but all prophets were not all prophets were apostles, but all the apostles were prophets. Okay? This is a, a really strong proof then, that apostleship and prophethood were the same. In the Greek, the phrase apostles and prophets describe the same person. One and the same person. Anybody heard of Granville Sharp? Raise your hand if you know Granville Sharp. It's turned out not to be a perfect rule, but it's a really, really good rule. That if you have a certain phrase that has, um, let me think of how much detail I want to go into. I don't want to go into a lot of detail. When you have apostles and prophets in the Greek form that would find that short phrase, the apostles and the prophets, it refers to one and the same person. It's like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is in that Greek form, the form that's nouns and the verbs and the connecting, the chi. It's all the same. And that means that Lord and Savior is one and the same person, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, same idea. If we know one person, not God, and Jesus is separate, Paul speaking of them, speaking of those two as one. Great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, one the same person. Same here that the apostles and prophets in this phraseology very clearly and distinctly means the apostles and prophets are the one person to appear as an apostle and prophet. Paul, Apostle Prophet, Matthew, Apostle Prophet. Okay? And finally, Ephesians 4.11. Somebody else read that out for us, if you would, please. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Okay. Now, this 
verse has to do with this idea that we have the small a apostles within the church, we have prophets, we have evangelists, we have shepherds, we have teachers, we have all these things in the church. Not everybody is them, but some can be. Um, but it's a completed act in the church. Again, without going into detail in the Greek, he's speaking of something that Christ did, accomplished, not an ongoing thing. He did this in the church. He gave these gifts to the church. Uh, so the apostolic office extended beyond the 12. Do the 12 still hold this special position? But their office and their function in testifying about Jesus' death and resurrection as eyewitnesses is what set them apart from the small a apostles. Okay. The small a apostles, apostles in the traditional sense, with this important exception. Jesus named the twelve, and the twelve were eyewitnesses to his life. They were eyewitnesses to his teaching, eyewitnesses to his miracles, and most importantly, eyewitnesses to what? Resurrection. His resurrection. Okay. Now, is Paul an eyewitness to the resurrection? Is he? Mm, you look careful. I'm picking nits here. He's an eyewitness to the resurrected Lord. And by that, he can testify to the resurrection. You know, right when I said that, I thought that would have had that in my notes. I said that that's true of all of them, isn't it? I mean, nobody actually saw Jesus come up out of the out of the grave, right out of the snow. Let me take that one back. Well, there can be a distinction if you're trying to make people who saw him alive pre-crucifixion and post-crucifixion. Like, they did see a difference in his yeah. regular and glorified body. So Paul does, you know, he is, he is separate in that way. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, again, the small A, capital A, apostleship, I just want to make sure that we understand that the function is the same, but the 12 are still set apart. And we get that in Revelation 21 14, speaking of the New Jerusalem. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Who is this? This is the 12 other names, it's the capital A apostles. Walter on page 24 says, We must make a distinction in the New Testament between those who are apostles of Christ, paren, big A apostles, and those who are simply apostles of the churches, small a apostles. And again, um, confirmed in Acts 13, 1 through 3, the small a, big A distinction. Now, there were, in the, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Many in a lifelong, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them, the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, he laid hands on them and sent them off. So Paul, remember, considered Barnabas to be an apostle. And there were at that time, apostles in the church, outside of the twelve. Really important for us to understand. It was important for me to pick that up, so I thank you for the question here. Apostleship, prophethood, continuing throughout. So it's throughout the establishment of the church and the finalization of the scripture. Not limited to the twelve, nor to men alone, either in Old Testament or New Testament times. So what does all this tell us? I really appreciate the question. This helps us along this idea of continuationism versus cessationism. Uh, against Pentecostalism, against the charismatic movement, against the third wave movement, the miraculous gifts of the apostles were for them at that time. And some in the modern third wave movement will go so far as to say that preaching not attended with signs and wonders, they don't specify what those signs and wonders would be, what they call power preaching is not preaching. Yeah, I don't know what they mean by signs and wonders in the preaching. Maybe uh, I stand up and preach, the Holy Spirit would smack you in the head, you, 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 you I don't know, have, have that, that Holy Spirit rolling on the floor type of thing that they were doing. Uh, John Patrick got caught up in that for quite a while. Did I tell you guys that he, he was here? We used to host the Whitfield, Whitfield Fraternity. It 
There's this meeting of reformed pastors and we speakers from Robert Godfrey and men of that caliber. Um, and John Black was here once. And it was a few, several years after he came out of that vineyard, charismatic, third wave kind of movement. They talked about how people sort of barking like dogs and rolling on the floor and things like that. Uh, as a bit of a, an excursion, excuse me for that. But the third wave movement would say that if you preach, and it's not, as, it's not as coincident with signs and wonders, it's not preaching at all. Uh, what's the church you're reading? Bethel. Bethel? Bethel Church in Reading. How many know about that church? Yeah. Oh, okay, everybody, with, with the glitter that comes down, that's the sign of wonder kind of thing that you're trying to contrive to, to show that the preaching has power. Um, they, they take it very, very far. Wait. So our question is, do miraculous gifts continue? Should we seek it out as a normative? So Waldron says on 42, I think it's helpful. Miraculous gifts are in some measure connected with the presence of the living apostles in the church. So what was this for? The gifts certified what? As we read through the book of Acts, and we see these gifts of the Holy Spirit coming upon people. They certified the presence of the Holy Spirit in power, bringing salvation to those who heard the gospel preached. The manifestation, especially by tongues, of the spiritual world. What was that a sign for? Not a rhetorical question. I want to hear your thoughts. When you read through Acts, Peter or Paul are preaching. And the people they preach to suddenly, they say the Spirit fell on them. In Acts chapter 8, when the Spirit fell on the Samaritans, when John and, um, was it Peter and John? Yes, Peter and John went out, and they saw the Holy Spirit, but we don't even know what we, they saw. We don't know what it was that made them sure that the Spirit had fallen upon them, something happened. Other places in Acts, when they preach, the people they preach to speak in tongues. What do you think the tongues were about in those cases? The apostle preaches, the Spirit's converting them, they speak in tongues. What's that about? Who would you guess? Was it just to show that something new was happening? Something new is happening. Okay, good. This is not, not, not normative throughout the Bible. This is, even in the book of Acts, it's not even normative. I think it's more on the uh, explanation of uh, the preaching for their own language. Okay. For their, for their own dialect. Okay, their own dialect. That's Acts chapter 2, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I would say it was terrified the church because if they had the gift of tongues, they can preach the gospel to other people around in other areas. Right? Okay. Uh, those are all good. Uh, good answers. Uh, tongues as a special gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a bit of a biblical excursus for us. I want to understand this. They first appear in Acts chapter 2. When Peter's preaching, we're all familiar with that. The tongues as a fire fell upon the apostles and he spoke in tongues. That's the first place we have. He just came across the sermon. Now this was inexplicable to the hearers. They were there for the Passover festival. They have all these Jews going by. They're going to the temple for the finalization of the, of the festival. Or perhaps on their way home and have to finalize the festival. Not exactly sure who then dare to it. It's those guys who were there for that reason. And the tongues as a flame fall upon the apostles and they start preaching. It was inexplicable. They didn't understand what was happening. It was only by mutual consultation that they found out what was happening. Now, I have to admit, I, I have an opinion that is not 100% held by every commentator or scholar, but it's, you know, it's widely held. I'm not, I'm not charting out new ground here, okay? What was the tongues? The, the explanation of the tongues is found in Acts chapter 2. Sorry for all the flipping. I left my own Bible at home. So I don't know if it's easy to get the pages of the Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 7. And they, that's the men who stopped 
you know, because of what the Spirit was doing. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? There it goes. They knew the accent. What language do you think they were speaking? They, knew, they heard the accent. They're Galileans. What language are they speaking? Anybody know? What? That's close. More specifically, though. What? Aramaic. The apostles were speaking Aramaic. That's the language Peter knew. That's the language Matthew knew. All those guys, Judas, not the one who betrayed him. They knew Aramaic. And they heard it. They say, oh, we understand their accent. They're Galileans. We know because of their accent. Do you know another place this came up? When Peter was outside while Jesus was being tried by the, the, the high priest, they said, no, you're with him. You're a Galilean. Because your accent betrays you. Okay? I think they're speaking Aramaic, the language that they know. The miracle of the tongues is that we heard. This is what the people who heard, the people who were there, who were gaining the benefit of this miracle of the Spirit. They say, we're hearing it in our own tongues. They're Galileans. We can hear their accent. But I'm understanding it as a Mede, as a Persian. Um, uh, Parthians, Medes. Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome. The miracle is not that I'm speaking Latin or Mesopotamian to you. The miracle is you're hearing it. Uh, thinking in terms of biblical theology, what is, what is happening here? Christ is preparing stuff. The apostles have come together. They've replaced Judas who hated himself. They're praying. They're waiting to see what's going to happen next. And here this happens. Preaching the gospel. Preaching about Jesus. We're hearing our own language. What's really happening here? Think in terms of biblical theology. Is manual. Is biblical prophecy being fulfilled? Prophecy fulfilled. Okay. Which, do you have a specific one in mind? Uh, Joel. Joel. Okay. Um, you're in Joel chapter two. Can you quote it without turning there? Do you, do you, or could you just tell us what it says there? Well, yes. Okay. Uh, I'll start in. Oh, oops. Let me back up one page. Okay, uh, verse 16. By, uh, by, but this is what, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your... And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall um, shall dream dreams. Good, good. He goes on to the rest of Joel's prophecy, and he says that I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs of the earth below, blood and fire, vapor of smoke, and all this um, is what's happening. Uh, so it's the Completion is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. So we can even say that it happened then. That's Joel's prophecy. Does it go on and on and on and on? He just says, what you're seeing is what Joel prophesied. Okay? As well as that, I think this is more the biblical theology that we really need to focus in on here is the reversal of Babel. Remember Babel? And then builds a tower to go to God. And God says, we all speak the same language. And because they speak language, nothing is going to be restricted from them. And look what they're doing with this unity that they have. They're trying to be like God. It's, it's one of the darkest chapters in all the Bible. And so he gives them all different languages. And they go off. What happens when Peter speaks the gospel? The resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks in your pure human language. It's the reversal of Babylon. It's the reunifying of people in 
Christ is the reversal of that curse. That's what's happening in Acts 2. And that's what the tongues are about. Okay? I'm speaking, I'm speaking Galilean, I'm speaking, Gal I'm speaking Aramaic with my Galilean accent. And it's something I just made my, my reservations for a fire conference in May. And I, was, uh, again, I know the person I'm speaking to is speaking English, but it's with that Mississippi accent. I had to ask her to repeat this out five times. That's not what's happening here. It's hearing the language that's familiar with. They understand the accent, but it's coming to them in their own language and understood. Um, fairly important here that the languages were understood. It wasn't just babbling. It was understood. Now, after that, tongues don't appear again until Acts chapter 10. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to move forward a long time. I'm going to run out of time. And what happens in Acts chapter 10? This is when Peter goes to Cornelius' household. Remember, he has that vision that three times with that blanket laid down with all the food on it, all the animals on it. Kill and eat. He says, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. Don't call unclean what I've clean, what I call clean. And so Peter understood from this, he needs to go to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are cleansed by the same blood as the Jews. And he goes to Cornelius' household. Cornelius, obviously, a Gentile. And he tells them the gospel. And then the Spirit falls upon them and allows them to speak in tongues. Um, Gentiles, that's 1045, 10, verse 10, chapter 10, verse 45, implying that the gift seen there in Cornelius' household was the same as they had seen among the Jews. It was seeing the gift that the apostle understood that the Gentiles were in the kingdom. So, what were the tongues about in Cornelius' household? What was the importance of the tongues in chapter 10 in Cornelius' household? What was that important? What was the importance of it? What did Peter say? The gospel to the Gentiles. The gospel to the Gentiles. Who was it assigned to? Was it assigned to Cornelius that he was saved? No. 
It was assigned to Jews. It was assigned to Jews. It was assigned to Peter. It was assigned to the apostle. It was assigned to the preacher. Okay? That's, that's really important. People didn't just, just start talking in tongues so that they would know what they were saying. I don't even know if they knew what they were doing. It's a whole other story. We're not going to go into that excursus. But Peter himself says, when I saw this, I knew that they were saved the same way we were saved. It was a sign to the apostles that they were saved. This happens again, and tongues, as a miraculous gift of the Spirit, as much as they get attention today, they don't get a lot of attention in the book of Acts. It doesn't happen that often. They are important, but not that common. Um, Acts chapter 19, this is Paul. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who is to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve in all. So it was for Paul to know that these had been converted and brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. And their understanding was incomplete. They believed only in John's baptism of repentance. They didn't understand that repentance was accomplished because of Jesus, or that there's repentance was useful because of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. They understood that. They had the gospel. They had speaking in tongues. That was a sign to Paul that these men were actually converted. Okay, it reminds me, too, of um, King Saul's conversion back in 1 Samuel chapter 10. He stole that after that by saying, he says, After that you shall come to Gibeah of Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines, and there, as soon as you come to see, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them, prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. But all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also known? It was a sign of the sign of the Lord. It was a sign of the man beholding, not so much with the one speak, not the sign bearer so much as the one who sees it. It's certified to be all of the God had done the work. Any questions about that? They're, they're very attractive with me. Are there any objections to what I'm saying? Mm. I remember hearing a sermon um, that the pastor was saying that that he used the word conversion because he held the opposite view that, that I think there's a, a terminology called a common operation of the spirit on an unconverted person. Okay. I'm borrowing for a little bit from Conley, but the, the, I think I think what the pastor, another pastor, was saying that he didn't think that Saul was saved. He didn't think what? He didn't think that Saul was saved. Oh, Saul, King Saul? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I would agree. I was just, I, I, was, I was just using him as an example that the manifestation of the Spirit at that moment, and the Old Testament was at that moment, <laughs> was a sign of the honor. That's all I was saying. Mm -hmm. I was saying Saul said. Thank, thank you. Okay, now I, I need a little disclaimer here that we have not dealt with First Corinthians twelve to fourteen. That whole thing about order in the church, and when you speak in a tongue, you need an interpreter and prophecy and all that stuff. Um, and there, there's some reasons I haven't. And one reason, to be really honest with you, is uh, I have a hard time figuring it out. The other reason is that things going on in the Christian church were very unique to Paul. Paul speaks about they do things as in all the other churches. So we had rules throughout all churches of Christ, even at that time. Um, the Corinthian issues uh, would just drive us into a long rabbit trail against what, uh, away from where we really want to go. And honestly, I do have a hard time figuring out 
how much of that was just at court, how much of that Paul really was doing in the other churches, how much should be in our church today. It, it can get very confusing. Um, tongues do seem to be prevalent in that church at Corinth. Paul does insist upon interpreters, that's 1 Corinthians 14, 6 through 13. And he doesn't correct, does not correct the use of tongues there, only that they use them rightly, which means for mutual edification of the church, none of which it compels us to extend tongues beyond the apostolic age. So the Corinthian milieu tongues could have been especially persuasive that the Spirit of God was in the church and not the nearby highly varied and numerous pagan cults. It could have been one of the reasons there that God made, God used a special manifestation of the Spirit. So for our idea of cessationism versus continuationism, dependence on tongues falters on the biblical evidence that the tongues were assigned to the preacher. And in the cases that we have them showing up, the preacher was an apostle, capital A, capital A apostles, Peter and Paul. Those are the only two we have. And both of them say it was assigned to me that the Spirit of God had fallen. So for Paul, that he completed the, the that God had completed the conversion of John the Baptist's disciples, that was in Ephesus, Acts chapter 19. For Peter, that the gospel went out equally on the same basis to the Gentiles as to himself. So when he says household school came to us, Peter knew that they were sick. When Peter and John went to Samaria, Leaving who? Who could say the Samaria? Did anything good come out of Samaria? Well, they wouldn't believe that. Read chapter 4 of John. Jews and Samaritans had nothing to do with each other. The Holy Spirit fell on them, the Samaritans. And it was assigned to Peter and John, apostles, capital A apostles, assigned to them that God had done the same thing in the Samaritans that he had done in the Jews. It was a Samaria, and then the same thing happens with the Gentile nation via. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. So, in answers to Charles's question, the other apostles, there were other apostles. Yeah, I well, thank you for asking the question last week. Uh, it, I think it really helped develop what we're doing this week. There were other apostles. There were prophets. But we have biblical evidence, as we've gone through, that the manifestations of the Spirit in the special ways that we read in Acts were to the apostles. So they know for sure that they, the church was expanding into those places. And that gives us a very good biblical basis to say that the Gentile, the Samaritans, the Gentiles, the Jews, all have the gospel. That's the world. And now that it's gone out, now that it's been certified, now that those preachers, capital A apostles, know that the preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the catalyst of conversion as proven then by what they saw. We can say it's ended because that foundation has been laid. That's actually that's Ephesians 2, laid on the foundation of prophets and the apostles. That's the one office. Prophets and Paul, remember that this, we speak of the same person there, not single person, but also prophet as a single office because it worked. So that gives us that foundation, that reason for saying we have the, 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 the faith once for all to the saints, as Jude, who is also an apostle of Saul, says in a prophet, writing that scripture. He gives us a foundation to say we don't have those miraculous signs, those manifestations of the Spirit as they were 2,000 years ago. Why? So I have an answer to that. Why don't we have them? In a practical way, biblically, I've been talking about who they were for and what they established then. Why don't they convince me? In a church sense. The layer of foundation has been lost. The foundation has been laid. We have the scripture, we have the record of Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection. We have the prophets of the Old Testament pointing towards Jesus Christ. 
We have prophets in the New Testament saying, yes, Jesus is the one. This is fulfilled. We have the scripture. We have the Holy Spirit working in us, bringing conversion, giving us strength, giving us power to do his will. We have the foundation and we're, we, we, we live and exist and worship on that foundation. After it's been established. Any other comments or questions now? I'm just curious to know. A little louder. I'm just curious to know like any of the reformers or non cessationists. Like it's hard for me to imagine like solo scriptura without cessationists. It's just I I just my own understanding. I don't I don't really just I yeah. So it's the pure means by scripture alone do we have the record of Jesus Christ and the rule of the church. Um, as to any reformers who are continuationists, is kind of what you're asking. Um, I couldn't answer that off the top of my head. Honestly, I'm not going to. I can't go through all of them and, and pick it out. But my answer, my guess would be, no. If there was a reformer, in the sense that you're asking, who is a continuationist, he, he's, he's got to be the the odd duck. <laughs> that you can't you can't have many. Because they are so focused on soul of scripture that we have the scripture once for all delivered to the saints. And a lot of their polemic was against Catholicism, where the Pope could, in rare instances, but the Pope could speak out scripture because he was the vicar of Christ. He could speak directly for God on his own authority. And so Sola Scriptura was very important to the reformers, and we have 66 books. This is the final word of him. If they're a continuation of uh, you'd have to ask somebody who's much more ready to do this than I am. But my guess would be that. Well, uh, so far the, def the, the, the definition of cessationism that you provided in the examples, that I can agree with. But I notice there's different iterations of cessationism. Mm -hmm that I've heard from one, from one uh, minister across the pond where he was asked, so do you believe, do you believe you could cast out demons in the, in the name of Jesus? And he says, no. Because those are apostolic sign gifts. Those are what? Because his, because his reasoning was, those were apostolic sign gifts. Oh, apostolic sign, okay. And then, but then like, but in the book of James, because I think the, the common understanding is the book of Acts is descriptive, the epistles are prescriptive. Well, what about the book of James where it talks about if somebody's sick, bring the elders to the church and anoint him with oil. And I see that more with the, the charismatic realm, but not so much in the reform realm. I mean, do, do, I mean, I guess in your experience, did you see any like reform pastors visiting people when they're sick and, and, and praying over them and with olive oil or... What's your take on that? Uh, I've never anointed someone, but I know pastors in our theological realm, good friends of mine who have, yeah. on the basis of exactly what you're saying in James. Uh, I said that last week when I started this, and uh, this was to your question there, but I know for your point. Uh, believing that, that these certain miraculous things have ceased, does not mean that we as believers in the Reformed tradition don't believe in miracles. I believe in miracles, okay? I believe that the Holy Spirit is working today. I believe that he's manifesting himself amongst the people. I don't believe he's doing it this way. I don't believe I have to hear somebody speaking in tongues to say, okay, he's saved, or he's got the second blessing, and he's now lived up the matter. That's not how they describe it, right? I can't get into that myself. It seems like you have a first and second class Christians in that way. But, but remember that believing that these sign gifts, these miraculous gifts described in Acts, have ended in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Yeah, we did that part. Uh, believing that those have ceased, and that there are no more apostles to have a layer of small 
and the prophecy of ceases. We have the scripture believing these things, does not mean that we have this dead kind of, you know, boring faith. I believe God is working. I believe God is working through us. I believe God is working through the preaching. I believe God is working with building his church through our efforts. I believe in those miracles. Uh, we have prayed for people in this church, even unbelievers. Uh, my nieces, well, she was still going there years ago. My niece's husband had um, blastoma glioma, was that the name of it? It was a terrible attack of glioma. Very, very um, aggressive. And we went to Stanford and saw the leading expert. He said, get your affairs together, take vacation, go out with your family, there's nothing to be doing with this. You're God. You're God. And we pray and pray and pray for He's not converted even today. He was healed. And it's one of those things that goes back to Stanford. Jaw trouble. He was healed. I believe that God answered our prayers. So the fact that we don't believe in that the tongues and these other things has continued in the church here does not mean we have this dead born faith and we don't believe God is working amongst us. God is working. He does answer the prayer. We've seen it in his places in many other instances. So, kind of a long search for answering these questions. But I know, you know, the question was the people sick in James, he talked about sick with sin, and they need to understand that if they confess that they're forgiven, true. Or is it people who are physically sick and be healed? I think, I think it could be a both hand. And I have new friends who are both both positions just as if one of the same as what Jim was talking about. Thank you. Okay. Hello, Mr. Riley. Let's pray. Let's get on with the day of worship. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us and we pray that you continue to guide and direct us and that you, Lord, would be exalted in this place throughout this day of worship.